lot of us have a window that's opened up that says the world has been turned upside down. Everybody is revisiting their reason for being. They're revisiting yes. their lives, their relationships, their work, their, their physical and mental well-being. And there's this like window right now where there is a level of understanding and forbearance for change. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. I saw a stat in a recent report from Indeed that found that employee burnout is on the rise and 52% of all workers are feeling burned out. So almost half the workforce is feeling burned out. Why do you think we're seeing this rise in burnout and what do you think we can do about it to start living a more intentional life that you talk about here? Yeah, it is such a fascinating question and you're right. We're in this moment right now um, that is, we haven't experienced before. You know, there's been this underlying dissatisfaction with the way that we spend a third of our life, like right. most of our waking hours for most people. Um, people have pointed to a lot of different reasons for it. <laughs> Maybe we'll dive into some of that. But the recent focus on burnout is really fascinating because you're right, like that, that is one stat. There are tons of other right. stats. Like everybody is talking about this and everyone's trying to figure out what's underneath it. And there's some kind of obvious things, right? There's the fact that when we kind of annihilated the separation between work and home in terms of like the actual physical It's setting. all happening, it's, it's work and home. Right, so people, you know, used to have a much easier time creating boundaries. You know, they're sort of like, okay, so I'm, I'm leaving the place where I do that thing called work. Even though the boundaries have been blurred a lot more in the recent years through technology, there was still some level of boundary. And now when it all exists in one space, and most people, they never learned how to create that boundary within the same space. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different thing. And then you pile on an existential crisis, a global <laughs> health crisis, extreme stress and anxiety about well-being. Um, and we don't have the cognitive bandwidth to actually figure out how to remake our work world in a way that actually allows us like to breathe. And so I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think that's what a lot of people are pointing to. They're like, basically it's the conflation of everything happening in one place, the demands of the workplace not going away and people not being structured and set up and having the systems and process and boundaries to do it. Right. But I think that's not the whole story. Okay. You know, because I think we're pointing to that. But what I think we're missing is the fact that this is not a new problem. It's been exacerbated for sure. But burnout has been on the rise on every survey, every bit of research that I've seen for the last 10 to 15 years. Wow. Right? So this is just kind of bringing it to the surface because it was the perfect storm of circumstance. But it's been going on for a long time. And, and I think there's an underlying mm. issue. And that is that the average person tends to wake up in the morning and go to do something that is not necessarily well aligned with a mm. fundamental impulse for work that would nourish them in a deeper way. And over time, that level of misalignment turns into outright conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but we never really deal with it. We never address it. A lot of us just sort of look at work as the thing we do. Right. Put money on the table, a roof over our head, and, and, and it does all those things. And those things matter to, to everybody. Um, but there's this has caused a level of sort of existential crisis where people are saying, you know, like, not only am I working way more hours with no boundaries with the and things no I don't understanding, enjoy doing. right? But also, we're, we're, the fact that I'm doing these things that really don't nourish me um, are making it that much worse, and, and everything is imploding. But there's an amazing yeah. opportunity at the same time. Yes. And there was a day after 9 11, you opened up a yoga studio. Was, is that right? I, yeah. So I signed the lease for, I signed a six year lease for a floor in a building in Hell's Kitchen, New York, to open what I hoped would become sort of like, you know, one of the premier yoga studios in the city the day before 9 11. Right. Oh, the day before, you know, yeah. The day right, before yeah. 9 11. You know, I was married. I had a three month old baby, wow. a new home, uh, lived in the city, you know, and I woke up the next day and, you know, like everybody else, like my first thought is who did I know? Because everybody who was a long time ago oh, right, right. knew people in the towers. And then the next thing was, you know, what am I doing here? Why? <laughs> but was it was there a, a point in your career as a lawyer before then where you were feeling burnout or there was a lot of integration of alignment and what you meant to do and your skill set? And so you're like, yeah. so you started to shift into asking yourself this question, like what should I be doing with my life? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's funny because, you know, um, 
this is something that's become really front and center in my work over the last chunk of years. But the truth is, the bigger question, the seeds really got planted about two decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was working as a lawyer in a very past life, you know that. Yeah. And, um, and I was working insane hours, um, just like nonstop, basically, 100-hour weeks with very little breaks, sometimes never going home for a couple days at a time. A huge amount of stress because I was a, secur a securities lawyer at a big mm -hmm. firm and the stakes were, were you know, massively high. And you had to be perfect. That's what we got right, paid for, right. you know. And I ended up doing that. I ended up, basically, my immune system fell apart. Um, a a large infection kind of exploded in the center of my body, eating a hole through my intestine from the outside and sending me into emergency surgery. Wow. So burnout. Burn this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you felt burnout. Yeah. yeah. I mean, literally, like my body was eating a hole oh, through man, me from crazy. the inside out. It was beyond burnout. It was sort of like I had nothing left inside of me. And that was a huge wake up wow. call. This was late 90s. Okay. You know? So this is a couple more, years before 9 11 or yeah, is it like. Yeah, this is like 96, 97. Um, that was a huge wake up call for me. Like I went back to work after that. You know, like I recovered. I took a couple of weeks. I went back to the office. Um, but from that moment on, I knew, like I had this question, which was like, how do we do this differently? How do we do this thing called work differently? Like, how can I show up and say, well, I want to do something that's meaningful, where there's a sense of purpose behind it, where I feel like I'm alive when I'm doing this thing, where I'm excited and enthusiastic to do it. Yeah. And there are a lot of things that contribute to that. But the seed, I, th I think, it's because I've been trying to trace it back recently. I think the real original seeds for, for this work were planted 20, 25 years wow. ago. Uh, yeah. And I've Burn never out. let go of that question. Do you think if someone's feeling a physical sickness or pain or like skin rash or whatever, that, that they should be taking notice of those signs as part of like burnout or out of alignment with your relationship or your career, like the physical manifestation of pain? Right. Okay. So, so first, let's preface this by saying I am not a doctor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But don't, as a, don't play one anywhere. Um, as an intuitive, spiritual so, human. So let me talk to you about my experience. Yeah. Personally, yeah, I, when I, um, and I'm under psychological, emotional, physiological, you might even call it spiritual stress, uh -huh. existential stress, my body takes the hit. What I've learned over time is that as a, a multi-time entrepreneur and somebody who just works really hard, I've trained my mind to a point where my mind can actually take a lot. Yeah. But even when my mind is kind of like, you know, the world is spinning, but my mind is relatively okay. The tell for me is my body, my physical body. It manifests in illness and pain and all the stuff mm -hmm. you just laid out. Inflammation. Or right. Whatever, yeah. And I've learned over the years that if I don't listen, eventually it brings me to my knees, you know, because, mm. and, and I, and, and I don't think I'm alone with that. I mean, I mean, does it, how does it show up for you? Because I think you can do a lot. Yeah. It shows up. Uh, I feel it in my chest. I feel it in my throat. Like I feel like something's like strangling me. Yeah. Depending if, if you know, that's usually like intimate relationships in the past where I feel like okay, I feel trapped mm -hmm. in like my heart and my throat. But then like I started to notice, yeah, I started to have like this eczema that came out at one point in the last couple of years when I felt like things were unaligned. And mm -hmm. then literally the moments that I that I eliminated those things from my life and just said, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not abandoning myself, or whatever it is, from what I'm supposed to do. It's like it cleared up within days yeah. after like months of it happening. And I was like, there's not a coincidence. I did all the blood work, I did all the right. allergy tests, and they were like, no, you're fine. Right. And I was like, well, what is this then? Like, why yeah. is this happening? But it was because I was out of integrity with my own, I was abandoning myself yeah. essentially with what I felt like I should be doing with my life, what I felt like I'm supposed to be doing, and I wasn't doing the thing I was supposed to do. Right. And that would man it, like my body was screaming at me, stop. Yeah. Course correct. Well, I mean, it's so interesting that you bring it up, right? Because I know we've both spent a lot of time seeing like a lot of different types of like medical specialists, yes. wellness specialists, done every test you could do on the planet. And it's fascinating to me that like when you go into somebody who takes a very holistic or functional medical you know, point of view, very often the first session with them is hours long. And it's not just, let's look at all of your labs, tell me where yeah. it hurts. Tell me about your like, relationship. Right, Tell me like, about this. like yeah. how, how are you feeling? Are you stressed out? Are you sleeping well? Like, yeah, right. How many friends do you have in your life? How yeah. often do you, like all this other stuff? Because there's definitely a growing acknowledgement of the fact that the way you live your life, that the, you know, the appearance of stress, the appearance mm -hmm. of, you know, poor relationships 
it affects you in a really powerful way. Huge way. Yeah. I remember Dr. Lisa, Lisa Rankin. Yeah, sure. Know, yeah. She talked about this where she was on, I think, seven yeah. or eight medications. and But she's a doctor treating people, but she was sick. And yeah. it's like, I think it was something with like her relationship or her marriage was out of, you know, wasn't working. And once she addressed the root of the emotional pain, she was like, oh, I got off medication and I didn't need this for my body. I don't know if that's the 100% the true story, but it's something like that. And I think it's, um, you know, this this idea of burnout or the body, you know, getting inflammation or feeling pain are signs. What's the, the analogy of like the frog that goes into like water and then it's like it starts yeah, to yeah, boil right. and if it you, doesn't... If you, if you, the, the story that I've heard is yes. like if you, if you slowly turn up the heat, slowly, 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 it basically never leaves. It doesn't jump out until right. it dies. Right. By the way, I... I I've been told recently that that's an urban legend. Yeah, you put a frog in water, you jump it's it a, out. It's an awesome story. <laughs> right, right. It. The but, story um, is like if you put a frog in water, like lukewarm water, it won't jump out. And if you turn up the heat and it starts right. to boil, it'll stay there because it's not feeling it. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, we, you know, we need to go through some type of extreme pain for us to feel it and kind of wake up and ask ourselves, what should I be doing right now? And man, I wish that was not the case. I have asked so many people, I know you've asked similar questions also, I've asked so many people over the years, you know, who have made these profound changes in life, you know, and, and went through, literally they were brought to their knees, <laughs> they, and, and they had nothing on, on so many different, you know, different domains of life, and then found their way back. Um, and I've asked so many people, and I've asked great philosophers, uh, great spiritual teachers, scientists, you know, um, do you think you can actually sort of like get to the place where they were um, without having gone through some big, profound thing like that? And almost to the one, the answer has been no, which mm, really bugs me yeah, because yeah. I want to believe that you can have a profound and powerful moment of reckoning, uh, realization, reawakening and reclamation without that. And I've probably spend a, a large part of my adult life trying to figure out what, what are the insights, what are the moments and experiences that we can create for people that would allow them a more easeful um, mm. process of awakening. Um, but it, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. And I've, I've been, I have this theory that it's the scariest place to be as a human being is when things are really good. Mm. In my opinion, the scariest place to be is when, maybe not really good, but when they're good. Right, things why, are just so good. What's underneath that? I would rather take things are really bad than things are good because I meet so many people that are like, you know what, Lewis? I've got a good life. Like I've got, I'm married. I've got like my kids. I've got this this job. It's a good it's a good job. It pays me like you know I've got a six figure salary. It's it's good, but you know it's just it's not exactly what I want. It's not everything I want, but it's good just enough to not drive them to want to make a change or, or see like growth in some area. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like they're, they're just, okay. Like it's good, you know, but I want more, but I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather have like, man, everything is breaking down right now because then I can wake up and go for, you know, something like what I'm supposed to be doing with my life and how I can really lean into that. So when things are good, and I know you're, you're the whole thing's about the good life, uh, project, but it's like when things are when things are good, and you're not driven to do a hundred percent of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like 70, 80 percent of what you're supposed to do, but not all the way there. It's hard to get that extra twenty percent. I think personally, yeah, it's I, scary for me. I know, and like we've had this debate over years. Now. <laughs> it's like, it's like, like you just be satisfied with where you're at. You'd be like, right, and driven so, for more. and I think a lot of it actually is. I, I think we actually really agree, but yeah. we just use different language. Yes, of course. You know, like because what you just described to me is actually not not a good life or the good life. Right. To me, right. that's the, the complacent life of sort yes. of like baseline getting by. Mm -hmm. Right. But but what I'm interested in is underneath that, or whether we use the word great or good, yes. like underneath what I'm looking at, the, the qualities of the life, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Do I have a strong sense of meaningfulness? Yeah, fulfillment, okay. yes. Right. You know, like, do I have a, a sense of like immediate purpose and also a larger sense of purpose in life? Am I excited and enthusiastic about what I'm doing? Do I feel like I'm fully expressed? Uh, in, in all, you know, on a personal level, on a mm -hmm. potential level. Yes. Um, and. I'm like what I'm more focused on, and I think this has been an evolution just in my personal thought is like, what are we actually talking about? And I think when we're ta you're talking about greatness and I'm talking about good, we're actually talking about the same underlying qualities. Yeah, of course. And I think the pursuit of those is amazing. And when you don't have any of that, 
then yeah, you wake up every morning and the world is just not right. Yeah, it's like the superficial, like things look good, but you know there's something more for you. You know you're like, you're supposed to be doing something. Yeah, see I thought beyond. you were gonna go to a different place too. Really? Yeah, because I, I, I thought what you were gonna what, uh, say was, um, when for some people, when everything's going well, everything's yeah. going good, um, there's a different uh, anxiety experience that very often crops up. Like what? And there's a different set of fears, which is all about loss aversion. This is all gonna go away? Right, like, which is like I built when's all the of this drop? thing. Yeah. Right, like the, the relationship, the money, the job, the security, the health, all of this, like things are so good that I think there is a pathology that I've seen in a lot of folks which says either, either I'm not worthy, it's not gonna work, it's not sustainable, and I'm terrified about this all going away or pieces of it going away. And then that creates an anxiety spin that actually leads to sort of like a contraction mm. in all of the efforts and all of the outreach and all the conversation, the honesty and integrity that would let everything keep going. Mm -hmm. And then you inadvertently sabotage the, a, a genuinely good status quo without realizing that you're doing it by contracting and not no longer supporting or investing in it. Right. Not realizing that it's actually that contraction and like the, you know, everything starting to go away is a direct result. How do we not sabotage that? when we are finally aligned <laughs> and we set up like, we have the alignment with our mission or our career or our yeah. business. We have the alignment with like, wow, we are, we're actually integrating the things we want into our, our relationship. We're aligned by not abandoning ourselves or how do we, Mm. How do we not sabotage ourselves Man. when everything is going really, really good? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> How do we not I, fall back in old patterns? Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. You know, um, a lot of it has to do with, I think it's a blend of um, wisdom, so like personal uh -huh. learning, uh -huh. a commitment to growth, right? Um, inner practices. Yes. You know, whether, and, and those are the practices that keep you physically, emotionally, psychically, spiritually um, healthy and focused and present um, and able to be resilient and respond rather than react. Um, and also external scaffolding. What does you know, that mean? The circumstances in your life. Uh -huh. um, and that might include relationships, uh, that might include your physical environment, uh, that might include you know, like creating all sorts of default states that help you do the thing that you know you quote want to be doing to support the life that you're living without you having to every day consciously make the choice to do it. Yeah. Katie Milkman talks a lot about this in her work and her research on behavior change. Um, and that it's not just about self-control, it's not just about willpower. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of inner and outer scaffolding that you can create that make it so you don't have to wake up every day and use all this cognitive bandwidth to make the decisions to make everything stay okay. Some of that you do want to be intentional, but there's also a lot of things that we can kind of put on autopilot mm -hmm. that will help us basically m take the decision or, or take the actions that we want to take by default without right. even having to think about them. Right, right. What about if we feel like we're in a rut? Um, how can someone do you think get out of it through, is it through a set of questions? Is it through a set of changes in their life? Yeah. Is it you, through an analyzing it? Is it through action? You know, I'm gonna give you like a, an answer you probably didn't expect. Um, because I looked at like almost every system that you could look at uh -huh. to try and figure things like this out. Um, and there's a simple set of prompts that I've come back to over the years that I find really powerful. And that is Katie Byron's The Work. She's great. Right? She's I great. mean, it's like, it's, what is it? Four or five questions, right? Yeah, like really simple questions. Like, you know, you're in a moment where something's spinning in your head that's stopping you from taking action. And you uh -huh. make all sorts of assumptions about it that paralyze you. And you ask these really simple questions like, is it true? Mm -hmm. Where's the evidence for? Where's the evidence against? Mm -hmm. um, so I think a really simple set of prompts can be incredibly powerful with that. If you're really in a rut where it's causing you mental illness or, or genuine emotional um, struggle, seek help, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. you know, Go and find professional help. But I think really basic processes and prompts like the work are really powerful. For me, one of the anchors in my life is, is a meditation practice, a daily meditation practice. You know, I wake up at, every morning um, for over a decade now, and I have both a breathing and a meditation practice that changes my physiology, um, but it also changes my state of mind. Mm. You know, so, so that as I move into my day, things may go south. You know, there, there may be things that drop into like, my day that I don't want to happen, that I didn't see coming. 
that really just knock me back. But what I found is that over the years, that practice creates a baseline level of equanimity mm -hmm. that allows you to sort of like be more intentional about the way that you move through it. And also relating back to being in a rut, zoom the lens out a little bit, take a little bit of, more of a meta view into the thing that is causing you this feeling of stuckness and be able to kind of say, huh, what's really happening here? Because mm. usually it's not the thing that you think it is. There's something bigger going on. And if right. you can address the bigger thing, then everything starts to free itself on its own. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, a lot of things where you feel like you're in a rut is you don't feel like you're implementing meaningful actions in your life or you're not, you don't have meaningful work. So what would you say are kind of the key factors to identifying meaningful work for yourself? Yeah, you know, it, um, it's funny because I think a lot of people like at work and like you said, it's all about taking care of like the basic stuff and it is, that all matters. Mm -hmm, right. <laughs> we gotta sustain ourselves in the world and feel secure. Um, I think the first way to actually really understand how to find meaningful work is to realize that meaningful work matters. Mm -hmm. so most people don't look at a job oh. and be like, oh, is this meaningful to me? Interesting. Is this opportunity meaningful to me? Is this project, will it actually give me the feeling that it matters, I matter, that there's a sense of meaning? We're not actually using that as a criteria to judge what to say yes or no. What are we using? Like, is it pay well? Is it... Will it advance my career? Will it uh, give me uh, power, prestige, status? Um, will it help build certain relationships? And again, it's not that any of those things are bad, right? But if all of those things are purely a proxy for meaningfulness and a sense of purpose and express potential mm. and excitement and enthusiasm, then you may find yourself super accomplished and utterly empty inside. That's true. You know, you've climbed the ladder, awesome. You've got the money, you've got the job, you've got all the stuff that like you, you wanted to check off on your achievement box. And then you're sitting there and you're like, okay, so I don't feel the way I thought I would feel. And now I've gotten everything that I tried to get. I don't know what my next move is. Um, and, and the answer is because those things aren't actually the things that matter in mm. life. They aren't the things that make you feel good. That they're not, they're, they, they alone will not give you the feeling that you're looking for. There's got to be something yeah. deeper. Whether, whether you do that something deeper in the context of your J-O-B that you get paid for, or you do it as a role in your life, or as a devotion, or as a volunteer on the side, like if it doesn't get out, if it doesn't get expressed in some way, shape, or form, that feeling of emptiness never goes away. It's almost like you need to chase more po power, fame, money, prestige to try to feel something, but then it's never enough. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. You know, um, you know, we're, we're in this moment now um, where so everyone's heard the term midlife crisis, uh -huh. right? The classic, you know, like you hit your forties and all of a sudden you want to blow everything up and like you know, like <laughs> yeah. regain your hair and like lose weight and yeah. like. But you know, and the thing, the thing about an existential crisis, an existential crisis is not a crisis of money, it's not a crisis of power, it's not a crisis of fame, it's not a crisis of, what it is a crisis of is meaning. You're questioning the meaning of your existence. Like, because you show up at a certain point in your life and something inside of you says, I don't matter. And the thing that I wake up in the morning doing that consumes a third of my life, doesn't matter. most of my waking no. hours, doesn't matter to me and it doesn't matter to the world. And when you cannot find something that gives you the feeling of meaningfulness, mm. you experience profound sense of loss um, and, and that can lead to um, really dark places. You know, so what we're seeing now. I mean, where people just blow up their lives. I'm going to be in divorce, right. I'm going after this, I'm right. changing this. So a lot of people will work for 20 years and then hit that point where they're kind of like, all right, it's just all built up, you know, and they almost cause it themselves. What we're seeing now is that people aren't raising their hand and saying, okay, it's time for my sort of like existential change. You know, the world has served this up at scale mm. to everyone. So a, a lot of folks have looked at generations and sort of like seen, looked at their expectations for work. Yeah, I'm Gen X, so like we're, we're the disaffected generation in theory. We expected nothing. <laughs> um, and, and, and just like put your head down and do the work. Right. You know, the generations behind me, I hate to use like generational terms because yeah. it's like, but, but the interesting thing is that like millennials, even though millennials is not one generation, it's actually like a wide range mm -hmm. of people. 
but like, so you fall into that group, yeah. right? I'm like an old millennial, I think, yeah. Right, so, so a lot of the corporate world for years has struggled because something happened in the generation behind me where the expectation for meaning, the expectation for purpose beyond money, beyond status, um, has gone up dramatically. Mm. So Since corporations, yeah. organizations that were built without assuming that that had to be something that was part of what they provided, and then they have millions of new workers coming into the organizations expecting that, yeah. and if they don't get it, they're gone really fast. Corporations have been grappling with this in a way that, and they haven't figured out how to actually deliver this. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, the last 18 months happens, it's not just millennials anymore, it is everybody who's mm. showing up at work and saying, we want more, we want more. Like the way that I have felt for the last 20 years is not the way that I wanna feel for the next 20 years. Mm. And I don't know how to make a decision that will make me feel different. Wow. Um, yeah. And this is this is something that um, the world of work is is starting to grapple with right now. Um, yeah, it, it, at a scale that we've never seen before. I've seen different studies and people saying like, okay, the work from home culture is here to stay, and people have more flexibility, and they're around their families more, and they're enjoying that less commute, all these different things. But then I'm also hearing that on the other side of the coin, it's like, okay, well, company culture is down and there's not the connection, yeah. the in-person, and the productivity is down because it's blended between work, life, all at the same time with interruptions at home. Um, it's almost like we were mentioning before, it's almost like the people used to complain about the commute to work, but that was almost a time like you, I don't know, you cross over from like, okay, here's my boundary. I do what I need to do to get to work, and then I focus, and then when I leave, I like clear my mind, and I get home, and then I'm at home. And now it's, you're working and you're at home the whole time, it seems like. It's almost like the thing people complain about, the commute, is actually one of the best things. Whether it's 10 minutes or maybe two hours is not For good. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, because it provided a transition window. A window, not right. like, I'm right. in my bedroom, and now I'm at the chair in my bedroom in front of a computer. Right. <laughs> And, and like we'd, we'd already seen a blurring that over the last decade because of connectivity and technology. Yeah. You know, the expectation that you're always gonna be on seven days a week uh -huh. and if like your device is on, then you should be responding. Um, yes. But when you actually then physically conflate your work environment with your home environment um, and you remove even that opportunity to like physically transition from one place to another, the problem gets exacerbated in a really big way. So like. All these things, we were already sort of like spiraling down into a, not a good place. Mm -hmm. um, but this has sort of like brought everything to the surface. But at the same time, it's sort of like you look at all the stats and um, there is no such thing as disruption without possibility. It doesn't exist. What does it's that mean? not a natural phenomenon. Like disruption and possibility are two sides of the exact same coin. So if there's a massive disruption, Right, you may be reeling because you have personally been disrupted. An organization, an industry may be reeling because all the assumptions that they built everything on have been shattered. But that moment, that level of upheaval, uncertainty and stakes cannot exist without equal and sometimes opposite possibility being birthed simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes when we're talking about like an individual at work is, yeah, like nobody saw, well, I can't say nobody saw it, the last couple of years coming, but um, what has happened has been profoundly disruptive in a way that like we've never imagined was possible. Um, and at the same time, like we're moving through a lot of pain, and and a lot of people had to figure out in the blink of an eye. Okay, so how do I get myself as okay as I can in the context of work? You know, there's a lot of other domains that they've had to do that in health and relationships, but in the context of work specifically and. They've kind of, a lot of folks have figured it out. Um, but what's happened in the middle of all of this is if there's this level of disruption, then you start asking the question, where is the possibility? Because mm. it, it has to exist. Right, it, right. It, it has to exist. What's right? the possibility right now? Right. So I'll use me as an example, right? For, we've been in the podcast world for a long time together, mm -hmm. right? For, um, the entirety of our show, 
we we you know part of the the big differentiation was like good life project will always be produced in the studio in person like what you're doing right, right. we want to raise the bar from the earliest day yeah. for production value we said no to a lot of people i thought would be amazing yeah. to speak with because they weren't in new york they weren't going to be in the studio and i wouldn't do anything remote you were doing skype or right whatever, i yeah. could not conceive and you were doing all video and everything right yeah. right i could not conceive of being able to have the quality of, of, of conversations the safety intimacy and trust you know, in a virtual space. I was just like, I can't do it. And if I have to do that, like, I'll do something else. So for six years, we produce conversations Crazy. in person in the yeah. studio in New York. And then I wake up one day <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's over. Can't do that anymore. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and in New York, we were the, the very early thing. So New York yeah. was devastated and yes. completely shut down. Um, I still remember the last live interview that we actually produced was Macy Gray, who came off the stage from the Beacon Theater, um, which was three blocks from the studio, and like came in after performing, and like that was it. Like mm. she left the studio, and we shut down. Wow! Right. So immediately, I'm reeling because I'm like, "Are we done?" You know, because this like a central part of what I'm about, and everything we produce and what we're known for is these in-person, intimate things in the studio, and I'm like. But we can't do that. Like it's just not an option anymore. Yes. So then my brain goes into the next mode. Okay. So massive disruption. Didn't want it to happen. Still don't want it to happen. But I know also that you cannot have this level of disruption without a similar level of possibility. So where's the possibility? If I'm feeling like I'm the one that's being crushed right now, where's the possibility? Right. And I said, all right. So let's start to test all the assumptions. Right. Katie Byron's the work. Mm -hmm. What is true? Where's the evidence for? Where's the evidence against? And once you start to realize a lot of my assumptions were really wrong. Mm -hmm. And now how can we actually completely redo our production process so that we can recreate the trust and safety and intimacy in the virtual space? How do we experiment with different platforms? How do we change the way that I go about creating things? And then we started to realize, okay, so we're up and running again, but doing everything virtually. And then I'm realizing, okay, so I always believed you could never create safety and intimacy in a virtual space. But what I'm seeing is that everybody is in their home right now. So we don't have the cocoon yeah. effect uh -huh. that I love, like, you know, the, where we're like in this, where we're casting a spell in the same space together. Right. Yeah. But what we do have is the safety and trust of somebody being in their own home. And feeling comfortable in their own right. space. Right, which yeah. is different. Not in their office and not in the yeah. Right, right, because everybody's home uh -huh. at that point. So it's different, but at the same time, it made everything okay. Uh -huh. And I realized we're having still like tremendous conversations. Would I love to get back into the studio soon? And do I hope, yeah, you know, like we'll do more of this as we, of course. Yeah. Then I widen the lens out. And I'm like, okay, so if my assumption has been we always have to be in New York because that's where everybody who I'm going to want to talk to, similar reason to why you're in LA, like everyone's going to be in one of these two cities at mm -hmm. some point, mm -hmm. right? Well, if we're actually producing remotely and our team is distributed around the world, you know, from the, the post-production side, on a personal level, what kind of freedom does that give us? Mm. Well, we've thought about living somewhere else. Right. Not you staying know? in New York. So yeah. all of a sudden, we find ourselves in September of last year, after growing up outside of New York, living in New York City for 30 years, pulling up our roots. You know, and and literally, like as I sit here with you right now, if you ask me where is home, I can tell you legally I'm a resident of Colorado. Right. I've been living in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, like we're pulled out entirely of New York, but we're also sort of like experimenting with different locations. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm and I'm traveling around sometimes with my wife, who's also my business partner. So we're in life and work together. Sometimes with our daughter, you know, like who's in and out of college, and so so there's this kind of like magical possibility. Where when you start to actively look for it, you know that is all around you. Um, but when you're when you're so fiercely disrupted without seeing it coming, and there's a lot of pain that goes along with it, um, it sometimes takes a huge amount of energy yeah. to pull out of the feeling of trauma, and wow. sometimes support and help, mental health, like you know, support from your community, everybody, to get to a place where you can actually start to ask the question: What is true? What is not true? And where is the possibility? That was a really long kind of rant. <laughs> it's all good. So if we go back to the question, what should I be doing with my life right now? Yeah. How do we start to answer that and figure yeah. it out? So, you know, and this has been the focus of so much of my work, um, you know, even in before times, what is really 
how do we find and do work that nourishes us, that makes us come alive? Mm -hmm. um, and when I say come alive, I'm talking about those things that I've already talked about. Like for yeah. me, it's like five things. It's meaningful, it's excitement, enthusiasm, it's um, expressed potential, um, it's flow. You become absorbed in the activity and lose the sense of time and sense of actually you being apart from uh, the activity. Yeah. Um, and it's a broader sense of purpose in life. Um, so how do we find a new work that gives us that feeling? Like all five of those things weaving in and out of the way that we experience work. Um, and for me, you know, I, mm. I've been fascinated with this question for so long. And a couple of years ago, I came to believe something I never would have thought that I would believe. And that is this, um, that we all have um, a unique impulse for effort that gives us that feeling of coming alive. Effort, you can just use the work instead. Like we're all wired in a certain way where there's, if we invest ourselves, if we do a certain type of thing, then we get a lot closer to that feeling. Yeah. Once I started to feel this in, in me, I was like, oh, I notice when I always do, when I, when I do this type of thing, I feel this type of, of way. I'm not talking about a job or a title or a company or a role or an industry. I'm talking really, really, really granular. I'm talking about like DNA level. Mm -hmm. you know, like, so, so when I invest myself in a particular way, I feel alive. And then I started wondering, is this just me or is this everybody? And then are there a mappable set of impr you know, imprints? Um, because if there are, and we can identify them and then somehow create ideas and tools that would let people understand what that is for you relatively easily, right. a whole lot of angst <laughs> would, would go away. And fundamentally, if you know, like I want to make things that move you know, the needle in people's lives, you know, that's what I want to do. And that has literally been my devotion yeah. um, for years now is sort of like identifying those and then helping people figure out like, what is that thing? So, And I took this, uh, you have this book, called Sparked, Discover Your Unique Imprint for Work That Makes You Come Alive. And there's kind of a, a quiz that you can take online. And I took the quiz and it kind of, it tells you your spark type. Yeah. How many sparks have? Nine? So there are 10. 10 and, and I'll break types. it down for you, yeah. right? So um, yeah, one, once I identified these imprints, I also realized, okay, so, so we found these 10 impulses, these 10 imprints for work. Um, it also became really clear that each one of these kind of comes with its own uh, behaviors, tendencies, and preferences that are really common. They're fairly universal for each one of them. And you know, it can be expressed in a really healthy way and uh, also yeah, a yeah, really yeah. neurotic way. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing to see like a larger archetype form around these. So I call them sparkotypes just because it's fun. It's uh -huh. the archetype that sparks you. Um, but this was still my idea and I needed larger scale validation. So mm -hmm. we built an assessment over a period of a year. We've now had about 500,000 people Complete the assessment, crazy. 25 million data points, wow. and gotten some really powerful validation from what started as an observation wow. years ago. Um, and you know, so for me, my and and, and the spark types you, you basically break down to a profile, and there are three things that are part of that profile. So we can talk about like yours yes. if you want, right? Yeah, so yeah. and first I'll tell you what the three elements are, then let's talk about what yours is. Okay. I think it's really fascinating. Um, so there's what I call the primary spark type. Think of that as your strongest impulse for work that makes you come alive. This is about work or this is about life in general? It's more about work. Okay. It's a really good question because when I use the word work, I'm, I'm including all of the ways that you could actually devote yourself to effort. Okay. It, it could, could be, be the job, thing you get paid for. Or it could be just it like... It could be being a parent. Gotcha. It could be being a volunteer. It could be like the, the art that you do on the side because you just can't not do it because mm -hmm. of the feeling that it gives you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really yeah. nice when you can make it the thing that you wake up in the morning, spend eight to 10 hours a, you know, a day and, and get paid for it. That's awesome when you can right, do it. Right. You can't always do it, but a lot of times you can get way closer than you thought you could once you realize what that thing is. Mm -hmm. So the primary spark type is your strongest impulse. Then we have what, we, what I call the shadow. And that's not like mm -hmm. the dark side. Right. I call it the shadow because it lives in the shadow of the primary. Okay. And you can look at that one of two ways, right? You can either say, it's like well, secondary it's almost. like the runner up, but what we've, we've teased out a much more nuanced relationship over the years. And that is this, most people do the work of their shadow 
in order to be able to do the work of their primary mm. better, mm. right? And we'll break that right, down in right. a second. And then there's a third piece of the profile. And that's what I call your anti-sparker type. So when you don't like, when right. you're not meant This is to do. the work where like, don't do this. <laughs> if you have to do it, it's just, it's emptying. You'll it's literally, draining. you'll do everything you can do to not have to do this. When you do it, you know, it takes the greatest amount of recovery. Oh, and the thing is, for a lot of us in everyday life and in our jobs, we do have to do some of that work. Of course. It is what it is. You know, but knowing that there's something deeper that makes you feel this way, it helps you frame it in a way where you understand what's really happening, where you don't picture yourself as lazy or just not devoted or incompetent. Mm -hmm. You actually understand there's something deeper going on. Right. And on a team basis, when you're working with other people, when everyone understands the impulses at both ends of the spectrum, it becomes an experience where you can really optimize. And also there's a lot of forgiveness and shame loss that becomes a part of this, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't feel a sense of shame for not rising up because there's something else going on. Again, you may still have to do it, but at least like you, you, there's a more forgiving emotion wrapped around it. Um, so th those are the three parts of, of any given person's sparkotype profile. Okay. So let's talk about you. <laughs> yeah, so my, my primary is the maven. Right. So, so the fundamental energy of the maven is all about knowledge acquisition, right? And that shows up in a couple of different ways. For mm -hmm. some people, it shows up in this just like broad interest in everything. You wake up in the morning and you just want to dive into fascinations, topics of interest, people. Like you'll talk to everyone on the planet. You want to know their story. You don't want to use it for anything else. You're not solving just a curious. big problem. You just <laughs> want to know and you That's have me. no idea. Yeah. You know, like everybody that you bump into, you just want to know, Yeah. right? It also shows up in sometimes really, really specific ways. We talked about this recently, uh -huh. right? Because we go back a long time. And when I first met you, you know, you, you were not off your, right, think, you were right? not off your yeah. sister's couch for that <laughs> right, long. Right, right, yeah. Right? And you had, you had kind of said, okay, so kind of done with being a pro athlete. Yeah. But that was sort of like the only thing that I knew. I devoted my entire life to this. So I'm going to look at this thing called LinkedIn at mm -hmm. the time. And it, I'm going to learn everything on the planet about yes. it. I'm going to know Obsessed. more about this platform than anyone. And I'm going yeah. to just dive into it. Right. And you became absolutely possessed yes. with being like <laughs> yes. the one person who knew yes. more than anything uh, you know, about the platform. Uh -huh. So it's it, like, I've seen this show up in your life broadly. Yeah. And I've also seen you go like, you just, you find rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And sometimes there's some like really good, like other thing you want to use the knowledge uh -huh. for, but sometimes it's just like, so fascinating, just the process of mm -hmm. learning, becoming encyclopedic about yeah. something in particular. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I love learning multiple skills and having just a tool belt of skills that I've acquired where yeah. I, maybe I obsessed for three months, maybe it was a year, maybe, you know, I did that with public speaking, with yeah. salsa dancing, with, you know, I'm in Spanish lessons now. It's like all these different things, right. podcasting, it's like whatever. It's just like, Right. Assessing for a period of time to and, learn. And what's interesting is for a lot of mavens from the outside looking in, people think that the core drive is the things that they're creating with the knowledge that they're uh, accumulating. Mm -hmm. And that's nice. You know, it's great that you've been able to build like a powerful career and right. affect a lot of people's lives and like a show that makes a really big difference. Right. And at the same time, at the end of the day, for you, like this is almost like in part a funding engine for your relentless desire to just go deep and learn and learn and learn, discover new things and like go deep into that sort of knowledge right. acquisition rabbit hole. Right. So that's the primary for you. So there that's is, not the whole thing. Right. So there is this sense of like, okay, because you have all these, these questions are very interesting that are in the uh, assessment. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I think one of them was like, do you want to, do you want to learn for learning's sake or do you want to learn to create something to like better something? And it's like, there's, there's all these different types of questions. Yeah. Uh, so that's the primary, the maven for me, the shadow is the maker. Right. What is the maker? So, I, so the maker for me is, is my primary. That is my, my main impulse. And that's all about making ideas manifest. It's like turning an idea into a thing. And I've always thought of myself as an alchemist where it's like, I love to turn ideas into a reality, whether it's like, I want to learn a skill and be able to apply it. I have an idea. I want to launch a book or a podcast. Yep. So yeah. what you've also said is like they might be complementary, like one, two, yeah, and, and, kind and of they like, could they could kind of be like fairly close impulses, yeah. um, and they they often work they they kind of like tag team with each other because they serve each other yeah. in a really really powerful way, right. you know. So for me, the maker showed up in my life. I was the kid when I was like eight or nine years old, where you know like 
I would have my parents drive me to the town dump. We'd throw bike parts into the back of the old Chevy Blazer. Mm-hmm. And then I'd go home and duct tape them together into Franken bikes. Right. You know, and I've been making things from the time, literally I cannot remember a time in my life where I didn't open my eyes and be like, what can I create today? You're, mm. I'm obsessed. Cool. I'm driven by the impulse to make stuff. Um, so you're the maker. That's yeah. your main thing, yeah. And that's shown up as books. It's shown up as companies. It's shown up as experiences, events. Mm. But the fundamental energy is idea to something. Right. Okay. So that's my secondary. Right. So shadow. that's like the the high end of like that's yes. that's the like the strong impulse for you. Right. Right. Now let's talk about your anti. The anti spark type is the essentialist. Right. Okay. So you and I share an anti spark type. <laughs> we have the same type of. Yeah. We we have similar yeah. profiles. Um. My, my my top end is I'm a maker of scientist, so maker primary and oh, scientist okay. shadow. So I'm like, I make stuff and then I figure out complex things, but it's almost always in service of being better at the, at the, the creation making. process. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't just go down a rabbit hole because there's a really cool complex thing that I just want to like solve this huge, big burning mm-hmm. question. And an and actual scientist archetype would be driven by that. I do it. I get to the point where I figured out what I need to figure out to go back to the creation process. Mm-hmm. So the anti-spark type, <clears throat> right? That's your your weakest impulse or the thing that empties you the most, takes the greatest Drains amount you. of recovery. So the essentialist, the primary essentialist, <laughs> the impulse is to create order from chaos. Mm-hmm. It's about systems. It's about process. It's about clarity. It's about a lot of granular. It's taking complex data sets, syst- processes, steps, all these things that need to happen. Like behind the scenes production for the show, guaranteed, yeah. you've got spreadsheets, you've got platforms, you've got a ton of moving pieces. I can't deal like, with it though. We have, we have like for our show, we have, we have around 40 episodes in production at any given time. Wow. I can't, like I have, when I look at, at that, I just want to cry. Right, right. <laughs> like my, because my impulse is run when I see that. And some people see that like this is a beautiful piece of art. Right, so our producer is an essentialist. And she looks at that and she's like, yeah, let me add it. Like, I want to build out these systems. I want to run them. I want to optimize them. I want to make them function better. Mm. I want to create order and, and clarity rather than chaos. Um, and I want to make it, I, I want to create utility from it also. Mm. So, um, you know, when you're not an essentialist, having to do the work of an essentialist is experienced generally as not fun in a really big way like i when i think about that in any company i've built in the past that type of work before i really even understood this about myself it would always be the thing that if i had to do it i would do it for as long as i i had to do it because that's what you do when you're starting a Uh business and you're bootstrapped but as soon as i was sort of like well enough resourced um to have the ability to hand it off or delegate it or contract it out it's it would be the first thing yeah um and also because there are people where that impulse is primary. They wake up in the morning and they're like, let me add it. You know, so why not have that person aligned right. with that work? Absolutely. Because then they're going to show up wanting to do it. They're doing it because of the feeling it gives them and the fact that actually if it's a full-time job and you can mm-hmm. support yourself, that's awesome. But they're probably also doing things on the side on a volunteer basis or a, a free basis that are really similar just because of the feeling that it gives them. Yeah. But for me and you, not that. <laughs> no, I'm going to run from that stuff. Yeah. It's almost like if taking this could really help you discover like what I should do with my life and what meaningful work I should be doing or is maybe this is why I'm feeling like I'm in a rut or avoiding things or I feel yeah. like I'm resistant to doing certain work that I'm supposed to do no. because it's not what you're aligned to do. And it's also, it seems like it could be an assessment that you give to potential people that you want to bring on your team and say, is this person going to be a good fit for this role? You know, it's interesting because I've been asked a lot. We've started doing a fair amount of work um, with this with this body of working in organizations in the context of leadership and engagement and team dynamics. And I've been asked, like, is this a hiring tool? Like, should we use this to hire people? And my answer is actually no. Mm. Like, I don't think this or really any of other of the mainstream assessments that are on the market for organizations right now are really well used that way. I, my take is it's actually a, it's a great tool to look at the people you have, who you love, who are a good culture fit, and figure out, okay, so how do we navigate what they're doing? How do we, how do we give them a set of tools and, and some insights that will help them really understand how to um, contribute 
to their role, to mm. their work, to the organization, to their lives in a way which is going to be most nourishing for them. And then within the context of the organization, potentially say, okay, so like, how can we support that? Like, does it mean that you're doing this type of work? Are you job crafting or re-optimizing, uh -huh. reimagining what you're doing in a way that goes beyond the job description that you were first brought in to do? But maybe it's actually going to make you not just happier, but more fulfilled, mm -hmm. a stronger sense of meaning, um, and allow you to access that sense of potential right, that right. you know is there. So, you know, one person who I know who I've spoken with um, who runs two different companies um, has described it to me as it's been a really powerful way to remove friction within teams, within individuals' experience of work and organizations. It's just like, it's like the wheels are greased. Everything just works easier. There's less tension, there's less friction, because people are showing up doing more of what actually makes them come alive. Right, right. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a hiring tool, but, necessarily, but more of a optimization yeah, of team. I think so. And that's, I, I that's think on- make sure, make sure you're aligned to what yeah, you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right, from an organizational standpoint, yes. And then just from an individual standpoint, where it's like, you say, how do we help human beings flourish? You know, the more that you understand what is that impulse that makes you come alive and you can show up and do it, the better off you are as an individual and the right. more you're going to contribute to society and show up as your best, which at this moment in time, we, we really need you know, more than ever. Absolutely. What's the link to do the assessment? Um, it's, at, you can just find it at sparkatype.com. Yeah. Sparkatype. Yeah, E. Sparkatype.com. Spark spark e e yeah. Um, uh, it's free. People can take this. assessment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And that was sort of like one of my commitments is... Um, you know, I wanted to make the, the the core tool that we created. You know, initially, in no small part, to to test and validate the idea, and now just to be available publicly as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that needs to be accessible. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So rather than um, you know a lot of sort of corporate style um, things, you know, right now where they're behind some sort of a gate. Um, yeah. I feel like at this point, this tool just should be available for everyone, especially at this moment in time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? What about, what are the best ways you've learned how to maximize and multiply our time to being more effective, more efficient mm, yeah. in our hobbies, our passions, our work? Like, yeah, this is some strategies you have? This, so this is not going to be a super granular strategy, <laughs> but I, I'm always, I, I'm kind of like a meta thinker. Uh -huh. um, um, you know, like a little bit like our, our mutual friend Tim Ferriss in that way. Like I'm always sort of like zooming out and saying like, what's the system at play mm -hmm. here and how do we... Where's the lever? I'm always in search yeah. of levers, yes. right? Um, and to me, um, being able to discern what actually matters mm. is the ultimate optimizer. You know, because you can optimize all the different, there's all sorts of tools and apps and platforms that you could use, there's strategies that you can use to optimize what you're doing every day to make it more efficient, quicker. And those will make differences, but the bigger issue is what should I just not be doing at all? Right. What should be eliminating? Right. You know, what do I actually need to pull out of the system? Mm. What What is the thing where it's taking 40% of my time, but, you know, it's only contributing 2% to whatever outcome that I genuinely care about in my life, in the work, you know, or whatever's yeah. being measured. Yeah. And I think when we start to ask that question, then we gain the ability to understand what really matters and what to focus on, rather than just looking at, like, all the things that we do on a regular basis and say, how do we optimize all of these? Like, what's the technology? Mm -hmm. Zoom the lens out and like, like optimize that. your discernment engine yes. and understanding what truly matters. What is the big lever in whatever metric is being measured and in the way that I want to feel? Yeah, eliminating tasks that aren't meaningful right. is I, I, the base way to multiply your right. time. <laughs> I've seen you do that over the years. Yeah. You know, like you have a team. Like there are yeah. things that you're Not doing really good at and, and trying to be love perfect. to do. Yeah, right, yeah. and there are other people on your team where there, that doesn't mean things don't need to get done. Right. But it doesn't necessarily mean like you should be the one doing them and then optimizing to do them better. Yeah, I was telling Matt this even last week. Uh, Matt on my team, I was like, what can I do to like eliminate more and more things and just yeah. focus on the thing that I'm really good at? And how do I double down on those things yeah. just to multiply what we're creating, impact, income, all, this, all that stuff, and to just feel f more fulfilled in my work as well. Yeah. So he was like, well, we don't need to do these two meetings every week. Like, We can just do an email debrief for you and save an hour there. Yep. We don't need to be doing this with you. And it, like, you should be focusing on the other things to get you more ready, more focused for the interviews, booking guests, being out there networking now that we can be out in the world and all that stuff and not being in meetings all day. Right. For me. Yeah. Which is like, 
more about organization and everything. And I'm like, that stresses me out. You know, the essentialist yeah. stresses me out. <laughs> so, but that's what we're talking about, right? So rather than saying like, rather than Matt saying, well, Lewis, let's take a whiteboard mm -hmm. and let's map out everything that you're doing and figure out like, what are the, what's the technology? What are the platforms? How can we do this more efficiently? He was like, no, 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 just like, let's just talk about what you shouldn't be doing yeah. at all. Yeah. You know, because that's the biggest optimizer. Uh -huh. And I think the, the test for people is like when they start to eliminate things and they see like they have more space in their calendar, they tend to fill it with some other busy work somehow. Right. So well, I'm going to check the email or social media. I'm going to be distracting myself. But it's like really scheduling the things that you need to be doing, in my opinion, and making sure that my time is scheduled for free time. Like I try to schedule in like nothing. I'm just going to goof around or have idea time as opposed to just checking social media or email. A hundred percent. And and eliminating all that stuff the, the most that you can. So that's what I'm trying to deal with with my time. Yeah, like if, if you look at my calendar right now, like I keep a digital calendar and, and I have certain critical things in different colors, but then there's also a block that you see all over my calendar with the letters KF in it. And that just means keep free. Keep free. Yeah. Keep free. For whatever. Maybe you're to do a meeting, maybe you do a right. call, maybe you relax, right. maybe you're in nature. Exactly. Maybe you're... And I'm like literally unscheduled. That's like cool. I'm hanging out here, you know, and, I, and I've been in, in LA and Santa Monica for a little bit now. And I'm realizing at a certain point that I'm three blocks from the beach. I, I'm a water kid. I grew up on the water. Yeah. Water is the place where I touch stone. It's where I like, I breathe. I, everything exhales in me. Mm. And I'm realizing I'm like three days into a, like a 10 day window here and I haven't seen the water yet. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, I have the ability to walk three yeah. blocks. Yeah. Right? There's, I can completely rearrange my schedule mm -hmm. because this actually matters to me. This nourishes me. It makes me feel good. I'm literally adjacent to this thing that gives me like a sense of life. And I'm, I'm just fi literally filling in busy work that's stopping me yeah. from doing it. So I immediately reorganized what I was doing. And now I end every day. I just literally go down. I walk along like the ocean. I don't even go in it. Mm -hmm. And then I go and then I just sit and like while the sun is dropping behind the mountain, you know, like north of Santa Monica, yeah. I meditate. It's beautiful. And it's like it's completely transformed me being here. Because I, I realize that matters to me. Absolutely. Are you going to move out here, you think? Uh, <laughs> be by the ocean, man. So Mark is calling your name. or like I Newport know. Beach or Manhattan Beach or something. Yeah. Um, sparked, discover your unique imprint for work that makes you come alive. Make sure you guys get the copy of this. Take the uh, Spark E-type. Spark E-type. Yeah. And if you test. happen to drop the E from the URL, yeah, we, we own show. the misguided Yeah, yeah, still so. show up. Yeah. Spark E-type. <laughs> right. Dot com. Um, a lot of good stuff in here that'll explain all the different spark types yeah. and give you kind of like application on how to implement certain things, how to yeah. remove certain things for each spark type. So uh, we've shared four of the 10 uh, here, but there's six more in here. So make sure you guys check this out and get it for your friends. It's really like a self awareness tool, right? It's like, it is. and the more self aware that we can become about how we feel, how we think, our behaviors, our actions, the better we can perform in our life, in yeah. all areas of our life. I'm all about self-awareness and like just learning more and taking in everything as feedback and information. So this is a tool that'll give you feedback. Again, take the free test or the assessment, get the book. Um, what else do we need to know about this? Um, I think w what we need to know right now is that we are in this unique moment in our history, like as a, as a culture, as a world, but also just personally, where a lot of us have a window that's opened up that says the world has been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is revisiting their reason for being. They're revisiting yes. their lives, their relationships, their work, their, their physical and mental well-being. And there's this like window right now where there is a level of understanding and forbearance for change that has been open because everybody's in it together. It's been normalized on a way that it's never been normalized in our history, in our living history right now. But that window's gonna close. Mm. The window's gonna close. Uh, it may be a year from now, maybe 18 months from now, maybe six months from now. And once it does, you will very likely find the process of trying to reimagine and going deeper and then potentially making changes potentially a lot less supported mm. um, or just a lot less comfortable for you and I would just invite folks whether it's a spark to type stuff whether it's your relationships whatever it is whatever domain of your life you're like examining right now 
to not let the opportunity, the possibility, the magic of this moment um, go away. Don't let the window close without at least re-examining mm -hmm. some of the assumptions that got you here. Yeah. Whew, I'm liking this, man. I'm liking this a lot. A um, couple of final questions for you. Yep. Uh, before, I, before I ask those questions, is there a specific link for the book website? Um, everything is just at sparkotype.com. Sparkotype.com, yeah. the book. Yep. Good Life Project. Make yeah. sure you download the podcast. Yeah. And obviously the book is just all over, you know, all this stuff. Everywhere, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Sparkotype.com. Okay, cool. Um, and you're going to be getting back on YouTube soon. So Jonathan will have more videos <sighs> we finally. We are. We are reanimating the thing that started like Good Life Project. I All know. the way back in Eight, 2012. 2012. Nine years ago? Yeah. Gosh, man. I know. It's amazing. You led the way for, for video, like high quality video production for years. Yeah, you we were. inspired me. We were all in. Um, and I just <laughs> felt, I fell in love with audio. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it just, it just like worked for me. And now I'm like feeling the call to do something cool back on video. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, There's a combination of both. You know? Yeah. If it's not all video, it's part audio, part for video. Sure, but. For sure. So make sure you subscribe to uh, Jonathan over on YouTube as well, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere for the Good Luck Project. A um, couple of final questions for yep. you. This is called, I don't know if I asked you this last time, but it's called The Three Truths. Yeah. So hypothetical scenario, it's your last day on earth, many years away. Mm. You've accomplished all your dreams. You've put the work, meaningful work out into the world. You've made your in, unique imprint, has come alive fully. You've expressed it, uh, but for whatever reason, it's your last day and you've got to take all of your meaningful work with you or it's got to go somewhere else. Mm. And no one has access to your information anymore. All your videos, content, this interview, books, gone. Eliminated, unfortunately. But you've learned a lot of lessons and you get to share three lessons with the world. Three final things that you would share mm. to be of service to the world. What would be those three truths for you? So you would think I'd talk about this and I would talk about work. Uh -huh. and, and that is for sure my deep fascination and professional devotion. But when you frame that question, um, my mind says, um, meaningful to whom? Um, and to me, the, the immediate answer, my intuitive answer is to my daughter. Mm. What would matter to her? Mm -hmm. And the three things that come to mind yeah. are all related, um, which is be love, mm -hmm. do love, and open to love. You know, be a, a presence of loving kindness in your life to yourself. Be, be loving and kind to yourself, but also just be a presence of loving kindness to other people. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't do anything, just be that presence. Right. Let it radiate from you. Do love. Like, do the verb of love. You know, like, make your decisions based on whether it will allow you to, to move into the world acting from that place and expanding that sense of love. Mm. And then the third one, open to love. A lot of people have a lot of trouble receiving love yeah, and struggle. kindness. Yeah. You know, and I and I'm I struggle with it, you know. Um we've known each other for a long time. Like you and I are kind of, like I will tell you, Lewis, I love you. Right. You know, and you'll tell that to me and, and we're good with that. But I'm not good with that with everyone else. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, um, yeah. but as, as a, literally as a practice for that, the, the sig line, like the automatic line on every email that I send, where it's just my default, is with a whole lot of love and gratitude. Even if it's like to, you know, somebody who's a CEO mm -hmm. and it's like a, a pitch or something like that. Right, right, right. You know, because I want to be that, I want to do it. Oh, that's good. Um, and I want to remind myself to continually open to it. Oh, those are good, man. Be, do, be open to love. I yeah. love that. Um, before I ask the final question, I would acknowledge you, Jonathan, for being an incredible friend for many years. 12 years, I think now? 13? Yeah, 2008? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I think yeah. it's 2008. You go back. Fall of 2008, I believe. Um, maybe it was 2009, I can't remember. But I acknowledge you for, for showing up in many important moments of my life, for, again, helping me facilitate an important conversation on my podcast about sexual abuse and that experience that we facilitated just impacted so many men and women who are listening mm. and helping them heal. So I acknowledge you for being an incredible friend, showing up, uh, being just a wise spiritual guide for me over the years and uh, very, very grateful for you and acknowledge you for the gifts you constantly bring to the world, this book included and all that you're trying to help people uh, with the awareness about themselves. So I appreciate you and acknowledge you for your incredible gift, my friend. 
Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. Before you ask your final question, yes. can I acknowledge you? Sure. <laughs> because I'm going to put you on the spot to be open to receive yes. your love. Because I think you've been in the public eye a lot. Mm. People look at you and they see what you've, quote, built. Mm. They see this, this stunning engine of impact. They see the conversations you facilitate. They see... Um, I know you as a person, mm -hmm. I know you as a human being, I know you as a friend, you know, I know your essence, and I have for a lot of years, and I've seen mm -hmm. behind the scenes, I've seen you struggle. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen you go through a lot of things, I've seen you make decisions from profound integrity, and mm -hmm. not so much, just right. like we all have. We right. all go in all different directions, and then own them, and I've seen, you have this deep devotion to self-examination and growth, and to constantly going back to checking in with your heart and mm -hmm. saying, is this right? right? Is this right? And is this like, is this coming from love? Is it coming from service? Um, and I want to acknowledge you mm. for that because I think people see what you've created professionally from the outside in, but being your friend and seeing your devotion to your own growth, to the own expansion of your heart, um, it's been beautiful. Mm. Appreciate it, bro. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. I receive. I'm open to love. Mm. Thank you. Final question. What's your definition of greatness? Mm. Greatness is the ability to close the gap between your felt and expressed potential. What I mean by that is I feel like we all walk through life feeling like we're capable of more. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more love, more relationships, more achievement, more impact, more work outcomes, whatever it may be. I think a lot of us, we walk through life having this feeling like there's something in there. There's mm -hmm. a potential. There's, there's like a hidden reservoir. We can't exactly identify what it is, but we know it's there. Yeah. And we have no idea how to unlock it. And to me, greatness is it's not a state we arrive at. It, it's, it's, a, it's a path. And it is the ability to close that gap between felt and expressed potential. My man. Yeah. How's it feels? Appreciate you, brother. Thank Love you. you. Love you too, brother. Let me know some of your biggest takeaways in the comments below and make sure to share this with someone you think needs to hear it and stick around for more inspiring content coming up right now. In the book, you talk about three buckets to how to live a good life. What are the, what are the buckets? Connection is, community or connection is one of them. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I want you to just like create, there are so many, it's funny, like for me to write a book called How to like Live a Good mm -hmm. Life, you know, except who am I? <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, it's like thousands of years of philosophers <laughs> sure, and sure. great sages and thinkers. So, and uh, what, but what I realized is, is that, you know, all I have are my stories and my lens. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the question for me was, if we've known everything there is to know for thousands of years, why are we still not okay in the world? Why are we hurting? Yeah. So, and, and, and I think a big part of it is because um, it's the models. It's the way that, that what we know is conveyed. It's not conveyed in a way which is like really simple, straightforward. You hear it once, you remember it. And the other thing is it's so simple that it's, it's almost impossible not to act upon it. Like it's got to be actionable in mm -hmm. somebody's lives who's a grown up, who's busy. Like you can't ask somebody to just constantly blow up their lives and walk away from everything because your average person in the middle years isn't going to do that. They would yeah. rather live the rest of their lives miserable than, than suffer the pain of blowing it up and starting over, mm -hmm. you know, and you can certainly debates on both sides sure. of that but that's just the truth on the ground right. so i wanted to just create a really simple model where somebody would hear it once they're like yeah that makes sense and they would understand every day how to do a little something so that over time it wasn't about big disruptive moves it's like there's a little something i can do today and then tomorrow and then tomorrow and then over a couple of weeks or months you kind of like stuff is actually better right and i didn't even really have to try it. so the idea of the buckets was look life is fundamentally about filling three buckets Connection, we've talked about love and belonging to your relationship, right? Between other people, friends, lovers, family, colleagues, um, source, you know, if that's something mm -hmm. which is meaningful to you, the natural environment or the physical setting you're in. So that's connection is one bucket. Second bucket is vitality. It's the state of your mind and body. And to me, to actually try and explain those as two different things is just ludicrous. You know, mind and body yeah. are 100% one 
universal feedback mechanism. You can't work with one without affecting the other. Yeah. So it's optimizing around a lot of mind and body, which you know, like you kind of become a master at. Sure. Um, and then the third one is is what I call contribution, and that's really about how are you bringing your gifts to the world. You know, are are you are you moving into the world in a way where there's meaning and a sense of purpose, where you feel lit up, where you feel like you you know your strengths and your values and your beliefs, and you are a hundred percent stepping into them every day with what you do. And when you lay your head on the pillow at night, you're like. Yeah, mm-hmm. like that. I feel good <clears throat> yeah. about how I spent my time on the planet. Meaningful today. work. Yeah, yeah. Contributing and living in service. You know, one of the I think Tony Robbins said that the key to fulfillment is growth and contribution. Yeah. If you want to feel fulfilled, you need to be doing one of those two things, if not both of them. You need yeah. to be growing, learning. You know, in your own personal life, but then also serving other people. It could be your family, your community, the world. It could be anything, but you got to be in service in some way. Yeah, totally. And I think you also, like, you need to feel like you're being fully utilized. Yeah. You know, there's, we, we did a survey, I want to say it was like a year or two back now, and, and it was it kind of asking, I can't remember the exact question. It's like, um, do you feel like you're leveraging, like you, you're actually accessing your full potential? And we had a whole bunch of different things that were potential pain points for people. And the number one pain point was a feeling of, I know that I have so much more but I can't figure out how to close the gap between the potential that I'm leveraging every day and the potential that I know deep down I have. Like, I can't figure out how to close that gap. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with self-ignorance, with just not knowing yourself well enough mm-hmm. to understand what matters to you. Like, what do you actually know, believe matters in this world? You know, because you can't be intentional. You can't wake up in the morning and do what matters if you don't know yourself well enough to mm-hmm. understand what matters to you. You don't know yourself well enough to understand, like, what are your actual strengths? Like, what do you believe in the world? Mm-hmm. You know, so how can you decide to do more of that if you don't actually <coughs> know what it is? So how do you find out what you believe? And what if your beliefs change? When you learn new things, you're like, yeah. oh, what I thought I, I lived in this religion my whole life, and I realized, like, that stuff is not what I believe anymore. Yeah, or certain totally. things, you know, my whole life's a lie now. You yeah. Know, whatever, I don't know. Yeah, and and it's it's there there there's sort of like this interesting split, right? There are certain things which you probably consider more like on the level of a trait. It kind of is what it is, you know. It's like you know you're a tall dude. Uh-huh. You're gonna be a tall dude your whole life. Yes. You know, you got a certain color of eyes, um, but there are also certain certain internal traits, um, and so it's th- things like strengths, where there's been a ton of research and exploration around them. Increasingly, a lot of people would now argue in the research world that you kind of have you know, your strengths. And there you can definitely help build strengths, but they're relatively stable, you know, over the, the period of your life. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's really important to understand them. And they're great short and fast assessments that you can use to actually figure that out these days. And then right. say, okay, I want to leverage these as much as I can, like when I'm out there doing my work in the world. Beliefs is the other thing. Those change, right? I mean, you know, um, I my belief system now is profoundly different than it was 10 years ago really? and 10 years before that like what I believe matters to me what I believe is you know about what's possible and what's not possible is hugely different you can change belief you can snap beliefs you can change them in a heartbeat you think that's a good thing or a bad thing if our beliefs change every I think it's a great five, thing. 10 years or whatever I, you know? I think it's an awesome thing I think I think the moment that you lock yourself into certainty about your beliefs is the moment that you stop growing is the moment where you, Milton Glaser, had this amazing conversation with who's one, you know, the most iconic living designer. And at one point, I mean, he has designed some of the most incredible things on in the planet. You may not know his name, but you know something that he's created. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, like, certainty is a closing of the mind. The moment you are certain, the moment, like, you lock down the possibility that something might be different or you might believe differently in the future is the moment that you stop asking questions. It's the moment where curiosity ends. It's the moment where, where un- the uncertainty that's necessary for possibility to emerge in your life vanishes. Because if you're certain about something, then you stop exploring anything beyond that, right? And, and the moment you stop exploring, there's no possibility in your life mm. anymore. Your life starts going sideways. Man, I don't know about you or like your listeners. I'm pretty sure about you and I'm pretty sure probably about your listeners too, but I'm not here to go sideways. Yeah. You know? What if your beliefs are already pretty solid? <clears throat> if you're like, <clears throat> yeah, you've got really solid beliefs. Yeah, it it's so part of what. Why change them? 
you know, if already you're living a good life with these beliefs. Well, so, but that's the second part of, the, of like what you were just saying is a really thing, right? So if you are an, indeed living a good life with your beliefs, no reason to change them, mm. right? But the question you got to ask is like when somebody's like, well, this is what I believe, I believe, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, and it's all good, and it's given me the life that I have. You know, the next question is, well, how's that working for you? Right. Like, are you actually sitting here <coughs> living a good life? You know, like, do right. you have these beautiful, deep, and enduring relationships? Are you doing meaningful work where you feel like you're fully leveraging, utilizing mm -hmm. the world? Are you connected to source and people? Or is your like, are you vibrant? Like, are you radiating health? You know, because if somebody says, I'm locked into my beliefs and they're good, they're viable, solid beliefs, and that's how I live my life according to those beliefs. And you can point to major you know, places in their lives that are relatively disastrous. Right. Something's got, something's not working. Yeah. You know, so part of the process, I think sometimes with, with if you have that conversation with somebody is literally ask them, you know, to, not from like an arrogant little how's that working standpoint, but just like, how's that actually working for you? Like that's, that's cool. Like if you have these beliefs and they've been with you for life and you feel like you're actually really living the life that you're, you want to live and you're meant to live. Go for it. Right. Keep them. Right. But if you're not, something's got to change. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it's like I say in the book, like, I'm, I'm not asking for anybody to buy into anything. You know, the only thing that I ask anybody for is to be open to the possibility that there might be another story, another truth. You know, something else that they can do out there that mm -hmm. might allow them to be better in the world. Yeah. You know, and then try it. And... I'm not a huge fan of just like leaning into what anybody tells you on pure faith. It's sure. Like run an experiment. Try, yeah, yeah. You know, course. let your personal experience tell you whether your belief is still valid or whether something's got to change. Right. Yeah. Um, you talk about how to fill the buckets up, right? Yeah. You go through each chapter and how to fill them up. What is, how does someone fill up the, co the connection and the community bucket right now with just this, this overwhelming amount of I need to generate more following on social mm -hmm. media and constantly on their phones. How does someone get away from that when it's the source of their business? Yeah. Is, it, is so digital connection, right? you know? Yeah. It, it's such an interesting question. We're moving from just hanging out like this, like mm -hmm. we are now to always having a screen between us mm -hmm. nonstop, you know? And on the one hand, it's not a bad thing because a lot of really great relationships can start Absolutely, they digitally. Have. For me too, yeah. Yeah, you know, and but but the relationship never really happens to me on the level that mm -hmm. it can happen until I'm in a room with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, even if it continues almost entirely digitally after that, it's different if I've actually spent yes. some time face Absolutely. to face. Part of what happens when you put a screen in front of somebody is that and there's really interesting research that's been done. Um, Sherry Turkle out of MIT and some other people is that um, it removes empathy from the conversation. You know, and so we stop actually having empathy with somebody else. You know, it sort of, it creates a level of not just anonymity, but like, um, so a lot of conversation happens in the digital space and it's what they call asynchronous, meaning it's not just, you know, like we're not just talking and like it's, we can look at each other and the conversation happens in real time. It's like you get a text or somebody snaps or whatever it is and you got to respond to it. And you're thinking, like, you actually take a couple of seconds to think about how am I going to formulate, like, what should I say, right? Mm. And when you do that, you're always going to present sort of cleaner, better right, version. version of yourself when you do that. And the problem is it removes those moments of real-time vulnerability. Mm. And, like, those, like, those just mini snapshots of vulnerability of, like, your dorkiness or geekiness or whatever it is that really makes you you, when those leave the conversation, th those are the most profound. Those are, like... Those are the moments where, where you connect on a level that blows apart like the shiny, happy self that you tend to show other people mm -hmm. when there's a screen in between them. You know, um, what's kind of interesting about Snapchat to me is that it's almost become a, 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 like a step back into that place of like being totally vulnerable. I think yeah. maybe because a lot of people know it goes away, right? right? So when I look at, you know, like the way that my daughter uses Snapchat, like her and yeah. her friends, like... They're, you know, like sharing all sorts of like crazy, silly, like dopey pictures, like yeah, yeah. hyper vulnerable. Yeah, bad angles, all the time. Like whatever, yeah. Right. And and that's kind of like become the ethos yeah. on that particular platform. Whereas, but almost every other one, it's all, it's almost the always. Reel. Yeah, the exactly. Reel. Yeah. Exactly. And that kind of kills your ability to connect on that deeper level where it's like, oh, I'm struggling today, man. Or I'm a, a bit of a weirdo. Or mm -hmm. I'm different than you in this way. Or like, I just made a mistake, you know. Those are the moments 
where the most profound relationships take root, you know, even on a personal level, mm -hmm. you know, like one-to-one -one with a partner in life, you know, if the conversation always stays at the level, it's like, well, tell me about the good stuff that happened to you today. <laughs> right. You know, and, and and tell me about the bad stuff too, but tell me how, you know, tell me in a good way. Yeah, right. Right. Don't, I don't want any of the mess. Mm -hmm. That's not a relationship. Yeah. You know, so when you allow for that stuff to happen, that's where the really juicy stuff happens. And, um, and so much, so often technology takes a lot of that away or just enough of it away that it strips away what's really awesome yeah. about the relationship. Um, and, and there's an argument to me made also that it, it deludes you into thinking that you actually are connecting with a lot of people and stops you from then going out and having those real face to face or deeper conversations mm -hmm. that make a real difference. Um, but so I'm not like anti-technology. I mean, we're sitting here right now and there's a lot, a lot yeah, of technology yeah. happening between us. Yep. Um, but I think it has its place. And very often its place is to find people who you think would be really well aligned with you, mm -hmm. start a conversation, and then as soon as you can, like take it real time. Yeah. Because um, that's where the magic really happens. And, and, and the flip side is also, you know, we talked about individual connection, but also community. You know, building, being part of something bigger than you where you feel like there's shared values and beliefs and aspirations is really important to us. Um, so and how, how can people find that? So yeah. Through their hobbies, through... Yeah. I mean, for like, again, it, it, this goes back to first, you got to do a little bit of work to know yourself. Mm, right. <laughs> you know? Right. And that's why, you know, you have so many freshmen show up in college and they join everything on the right. planet. Right. And they come home at the end of the freshman year and they're, they feel alone and isolated. Right, and it's not because they haven't tried, and they're not—they're surrounded by people all day, every day. Right. It's because they actually never just hit pause long enough to do a little bit of work to learn about themselves enough to actually know, well, this is what needs to be in place. Like, I want to join a club where you know, like everybody's you know, like there's their their social wiring is a little bit quieter, you know, and they want to you know, like they're kind of into art and they really dig nature. And um, they have deep philosophical conversations rather than I want to join you know, like a fraternity where it's all about partying, people like really extroverted and social. Not that mm -hmm. that's every fraternity, but, right. you know, to know which of those things is right for you, you got to know yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, we don't do that work. And it's actually not um, to just get at least a baseline level of knowledge about like who we are and what we care about doesn't take that much work right it just takes a willingness to go a little bit deeper into ourselves before we try and actually go out into the world and find like involve ourselves with relationships and communities that actually resonate with who we really are rather than the facade of who we think we should be mm -hmm. how we find ourselves what's, yeah. what's the uh, asking questions um, you know there are, there are a set of baseline assessments that we've used in different programs that we've run and stuff like that like uh, we've used for you know, strengths for example yep. you know there are two big assessments one the strengths finder yep. which a lot of people know it's probably a lesser known one called the via um, strengths assessment and that that actually is really heavily researched and came out of the world of positive psychology mm -hmm. And so both of these things generally, they'll give you, you take a questionnaire, take a, take it takes a 20 minutes, yeah, yeah. right? And they'll <clears> give you a list of like 20 to 25 strengths. And your top five are generally the ones which really are the heartbeat of the things. And, but they're different also. Like the via strengths is more about your, your virtues, you know, and whereas strengths finder would probably be more apt to describe them more along the lines of like your talents or your gifts. But either way, the idea is once you have a sense of these things, like can you move through your day? in a way where you're leveraging them as much as you possibly can. Because when you build your life around your ability to leverage those things, rather than spend all of your time trying to fix what's wrong, mm -hmm. a lot of what's wrong starts to drop away. Yeah. And you feel like really empowered. Same thing when it comes to you know, like your values and beliefs. You start asking questions. Like the most fundamental question, like the question you start with is, what's important to me? You know, and then your first line answer is going to be something like, well, family or money or power or, right. you know, cars, whatever it may be. You know, and a lot of people stop there. Like, let me just, what are my top five there? And that's going to give you really shallow answers, which is going to give you really shallow life. You know, so then you ask the next question. You essentially keep asking that question. Well, of these things, like, why are they important? Mm -hmm. You know, and then why are they important? You keep asking the why question until you get down to like a deeper emotional level of why these things matter. So it's not hard, but sometimes it's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we don't do the work. You know, I know over the last few years, Nick, we've been friends for a while now, mm -hmm. 
you've gone deep real deep on a personal yeah, yeah. level you know mm-hmm. like you, to see what you've gone like to see the depth that you've like learned yourself mm-hmm. it's kind of stunning mm-hmm. and so much of the of the shift that you've made in your professional life and your personal life over the last three years you know have been an outgrowth of just a deep process of self-discovery right. really knowing yourself on a level that when we first met like your level of self-knowledge and the way you bring yourself to the world is so different mm. you know it's like it's palpable and i think people feel that they yeah. respond to it yeah you know the funny thing is i feel like i'm just getting started you know yeah totally it's like oh man there's so much more to discover you know yeah well, i feel like i figured something out it's like no you haven't figured anything out right you know? right you always hit that threshold you're like i think i have it dialed in like the next step is like I know nothing. I know it's the worst. Completely <laughs> ignorant. <laughs> it's, it's like good though to keep questioning your beliefs and values and make sure that you're doing what works for you and the world. Yeah, you know? and it's like it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, like is is to be open. You know, and and I look at things like this as okay. This is my snapshot. This is a moment in time right now. Right. This is what I think I know and understand mm-hmm. about myself and about the world and the way that I that I move into it. Um, but I'm going to keep asking questions. I'm going to keep running experiments. I look at, you know, so my current company, you know, we've been around for four years now. Mm-hmm. We're growing nicely. But built into the name of the company is the word project. You know, because to me, it's a series of experiments. This is a project for me. You know, and, and I wonder if we looked at building a good life as just a project with a series of experiments. You know, like that would give us so much more freedom to allow ourselves to be open to whatever the experiments yield rather than saying like this has to succeed now in this window of time. It's like, no, I'm going to run an experiment. You know, my my goal is to actually just learn, Mm -hmm. you know, and this may give me an answer that I really want, which would be awesome. Yeah. May give me an answer that I'm not all that comfortable with. Right. But then the question is, so what do I do with that? Right. You know, and then how do I actually run the next experiment and then the next? I'm I'm such a huge fan of experiments or games, whatever you want to call them for no. me. I feel like that's the way I learn is by taking on a challenge. Okay, for this week, for this month, I'm going to do something every single day to see what works, what didn't work, or what I learned from it. And I feel like, and I usually do it around things I'm most afraid of. Yeah. Things I'm most afraid of. Like what's an I, example of that? Like, what's like when I was a teenager, was like I was terrified to talk to girls. Yeah. So every day I was like, anytime I get butterflies when I see a girl that I like, I have to go up and talk to her. Right. Like that's my challenge. That's my game for the day. And uh, and just say hello and see where the conversation goes. It was right. like terrifying. Another one was public speaking. I was terrified to speak in public, so I said, okay, every week I'm going to go to a public speaking class for mm. a year. And I did that, and I was able to see so much growth over the year. It was yeah. terrifying. It was horrible. It was, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of pain and suffering. But I see where I'm at now, like eight, nine years later from when I started that challenge. Like I'm able to really be in front of people and make an impact. You know, still a lot more right. to go, still a lot farther to grow. But if I didn't take on that experiment or that challenge of that project years ago, then I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And so I constantly take on challenges, projects, games, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I feel like that's the juice. It's like what you learn. That's like my master's program, you know? Yeah. It's when we take on those projects. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, the moment that you decide that you're done, that you're good, that you got it all figured out, to me, is the moment that you start living. I mean, stop living. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's the moment that, like we yeah. said, that's the moment that growth ends. You know? And at some point, you'd love to be like, I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> the quote that I throw around. It's part of like our good life project, Living Creed. It's right towards the end, which is a good life is not a place at which you arise, it's a lens through which you see and create your world. You know? And so many of us are like, they're like, when I get there, then I'm going to be living that good right, life, right, right. right? It's like when I get this, I'm going to be living that good life. Yeah. And like, I just need this much money in the bank or this house or this relationship or this power job. Mm-hmm. And and then they get there and they're like, you know, just a little bit more, you know, that's yeah. the answer is just, and there's actually really fascinating research around this that's been done where people, you know, they'll ask, well, how much do you need to feel like, you know, like you're, you're good in life, mm-hmm. you know? And they say, well, and a million dollars. Or right. Whatever. And then they'll track people like, you know, like when they actually hit that number. And then they're not good. Never. Literally never. You know, then the, the, the amount is always a little more. bit further down the road. Why is that? It's, I think it's just the way that we're wired. We're constant, we're wired for more. You know, we're wired for discontent to a certain extent. And it's it's really interesting. Um, I think part of it is just societally. You know, like Mm. we're taught that these particular things matter. You know, like these, there's a set of metrics that that tell you when you've made it, when you're actually living that good life. 
you know, and it's kind of predefined by culture. You know, so what's interesting is that if you actually look at the American culture or Western culture in general, it's pretty universal, right? It's a certain amount of money. It's mm -hmm. a job that makes a certain amount of money. It has a certain amount of prestige, a certain amount of cars in the garage, you know, a house of a certain size or an apartment of a certain size. You know, like it's all these standardized things, which basically are checkpoints that say, okay, now you're living that good life. But when you actually leave Western culture, you go into more Eastern-based cultures, the metrics change pretty profoundly. Even Western culture that's European versus American, you know, the emphasis on family. Family, community. In Europe or South America, <coughs> Central travel. America. Totally different. Yeah. You know, it's so much less about what we have or how much we're making. I mean, if you go to Ireland and you're like, the first question out of your mouth is, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> People are like, what's wrong with you? Right. You know, it's like they care about, like, who are you as a human? They care, they're actually more interested in, like, you know, who is your family? Um, and so there's, there's just become this really strong emphasis on what you have as the metric for living a good life in the U.S. And even in Western countries where it's not the U.S. base, it shifts pretty quickly to how deep are your relationships? How much time do you spend with people that you love that you can't get enough of? Then when you go even farther east, it's how much stillness do you have in your life? You know, it's how, how at peace are you? You know, do you lay your head down at the end of the day feeling like you've done meaningful work, mm -hmm. you've been of service, and you're at peace? You know, so if we actually started to exalt those as metrics that really define a life well lived, man, so many of us would then start to realize, oh, I could actually have that right now. Yeah, I don't need to chase something. Yeah, like yeah. I could be living this now. It's just a matter of like, I want to wear a different lens, mm -hmm. you know, now. And it, it relieves so much pain because we don't have to feel like we're just, this is all about suffering until I quote make it. It's like, no, you know, like maybe circumstances aren't exactly as I need them to be now, but there's a whole lot of good right now yeah. too. And if I shift the metrics of what it means to actually be living that awesome life, there's so much which I can either just see right, right here now that I don't see or create in the moment you know because i have control over my choice mm -hmm. like i can move from being massively reactive and maniacally busy doing things that are generally um not all that meaningful to me and set by somebody else's agenda right so i, I rest my head on my pillow at the end of the day being frazzled stressed no peace at all yeah. wiped out and when you ask me how my day was, I'll tell you busy. And you'll ask, you know, ask, well, like, what did you do that mattered? And you'd be like, I really don't know. Mm. Versus saying, okay, I'm going to wake up in the morning. And the first thing I'm going to do is just spend a few minutes in stillness to just like, you know, get into myself. And then ask myself, all right, what's the single most meaningful thing that I, the one single most meaningful thing that I could do today? You know, like, let me do that. Everything, anything else that happens beyond that, awesome bonus, bonus yeah. right <laughs> right yeah you know so check as many boxes as you want after that you know and ask you know and you wake up in the morning and this is like a morning bucket check right really quick scan you know like how how full is my vitality bucket today you know it's zero to ten yeah it's about a seven right how full is my connection bucket today yeah it's it's an eight like i feel like i'm i'm doing really good i'm in loving relationships i'm like i've been talking to my friends and hanging out mm -hmm. with them you know, how full is my, my contribution bucket? I don't feel like I've been doing stuff that's really mattering to me or like my strengths. I just don't feel like I'm really leveraging myself all that fully. It's, it's kind of low, right? So I'm probably going to say, okay, so today I want to focus on doing a little something to fill that contribution bucket. I want to really figure out, okay, what can I do today that's really going to make me feel like I'm standing in my strengths? You know, and you just like, you don't have to make the whole day maniacally about this. Just like, what's one little action I can take that'll fill that bucket a little bit? And, like, you can rest your head at the pillow, you know, on your pillow at the end of the day saying, yeah, like, mm -hmm. okay, A, I chose instead of just responding to other people's agendas. Yes. So right away, it's a win, right? Mm -hmm. you, there's, there's something I call reactive life syndrome, right? Which is basically we go through life you're being dominated by other people's agendas and being maniacally busy with stuff that doesn't matter to us. Mm -hmm. You're like, the minute you choose, then that goes out the window because you move from being reactive to intentional. Right. And that's where life really starts mm. to light up. Where do you think our suffering comes from? Uh, life. <laughs> I think so much of it comes from um, expectations. Expectations about, about what we should have, who we should be, um, what life is supposed to be like. Uh, I think part of it is also, so part of it is expectations that have us chasing 
things that we think really matter mm. that don't. Um, you know, there's a, and so part of it is that part of it is that we are also, most of us are soft wired to seek security slash, which is also just another word for certainty. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's only one thing in life that I am absolutely certain about. And that is that we can never have certainty, right? So, so there's literally no conceivable way. There's nothing that we can do today or for the rest of our lives to lock down a certain future, mm -hmm. a certain minute, a certain moment, right? 9-11 for me was a huge wake up call, Yeah, you know? Um, <clears throat> so by definition, if we invest the vast majority of our waking hours in trying to pursue something that's impossible to attain for our entire lives, that's suffering. Mm. You know, rather than saying, listen, I don't know what the future holds. I, I, I'm going to lock it down as much as I can. You know, I'm I have a vision. I want to have some money in the bank yeah, so yeah. my family's taken care of. You know, like, yes. But fundamentally, I'm also going to acknowledge the fact that to a large extent, it's unlockdownable. I'm going to work really hard to do great work and do good things in the world. But at the same time, I know at the end of the day, life's uncertain. Yeah, I think I learned that early on when I was 23 or 24. You know, I had a dream to play in the NFL when yeah. I got injured. Right. And I was like, my whole life was changed because there was no other option. This was like, this is happening. I'm going to make it happen. But when I wasn't open to, okay, well, things change or things are uncertain or things, you know, maybe there's a different path for me. Like I wasn't even open to it. And so there was like this suffering and this pain and depression for a year and a half, two years, because I was just like, what do I do now? Yeah. What, so I'm curious what, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. Probably a bunch of times. But I don't think I've ever asked you like, what, what snapped you out of it? Like what took you from a place of mm -hmm. like laying on your sister's couch to back to a place of curiosity and possibility? I, I think, uh, you know, my, my dad had gone through a, a really bad accident at the same time, a head trauma and he was in a coma for a few months and he wasn't able to really, he's still alive, but he hasn't been able to fully kind of recover to mm -hmm. the dad that I knew. Uh, emotionally, spiritually, he's just had a head trauma and uh, it's, you know, so it's been hard for him to get back. And I remember taking care of him. We like had to teach him how to write and how to talk again and how to like, just do normal functional things, remember certain things. And uh, I remember being like, wow, okay. Like I don't have my dad to like just have my back or to uh -huh. like go to mentor me to kind of lean back on. He was always like my safety net. Yeah, He was always like, go live your dream and then come work for me, you know, go do your thing. And then when you're ready, when you're done with that, like I've got a spot for you right. type of thing. So I never had to like figure it out on my own. He was always there to support me. And after a couple of years, I'm on my sister's couch. I was like, Oh, my dad's not going to be able to support me. I'm, I'm not going to be able to like have him anymore as a mm -hmm. safety net. I was like, well, I can either continue living like this and feel like a worthless piece of crap on my sister's couch, yeah. adding no value to the world, or I can figure out what I'm gonna do the rest of my life. And, um, that's when I started taking on these challenges. I was like, okay, well, yeah. I want to make an impact. I need to learn how to speak and communicate right. cause I was just a big dumb jock, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had a big heart and I could connect with people, but I didn't right. know how to deliver and package my message in a way that people were able to receive it. Mm. And so I started doing public speaking and then learning about online marketing. Cause I was like, I just need to make money. And I was just like, okay, I'm discovery mode now and I'm going to try everything. Uh. And, um, I think that's what it was. I just made a decision after a couple of years. I was like, okay, I'm going to be something. I'm yeah. going gonna, I'm gonna to make something of my life. I'm going to make an impact. I'm going to make a difference. You know, I'm going to show people that I matter and, um, and do something with my life. So yeah. that's it's just time and uh, awareness and awakening. You know? Yeah. And I, I think that's what happens with so many people too. It's sort of like you're, like you're wallowing and wallowing and wallowing. Yeah. And like you hit a point where you just like, look, I'm sick and tired of being sick it, and tired. If, right. right. It's like if I don't make a different choice now, this is going to be my life. That's it. And I'm not liking the trajectory yeah. that this has taken. It's sort of like this is this is one of the things that made me leave the law like way back mm -hmm. in the day. It's like I was I was coming up on 30 years old, you know, and I'm like, if I don't do this now, it's going to be another 20 years yeah. before I make this decision. And even though I wasn't comfortable doing it, and because you're was making like, good money, you got yeah, security. Like yeah, I had the, the job that everybody wanted. You know, and I was like, but if I don't do this now, I literally, it's going to be a couple of decades before I'm going to be back in this place where I'm going to be willing to actually extract myself from the yeah. pain that I'm feeling now. Yeah. Um, so I'm always, I'm always so curious, like what those inciting incidents yeah. are for people. Um, I think I also had nothing to lose. I didn't have a job. Uh, I didn't have a family. I didn't have right. these things. So it's like, 
let me just go see what I can create yeah. since I'm already at the bottom, you know? Um, yeah, it was interesting. It was definitely an interesting time. But yeah. it's like, you got to build momentum, you know? It's like I yeah. had nothing, and I just had to build momentum. It takes a while. So, so here, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm taking over the interview. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's like, but I'm really curious because we've never talked about this. So like, part, of, part of the reason I wrote this, like when it mm-hmm. really comes down to it, is because I, I would love for this book to go out into the world and be the inciting incident that, that inspires somebody to say, wait. Let me think about things differently. Like yes. maybe like this is a moment where I don't have to blow things up. Right. I can actually start. I'm curious with, with School of Greatness when mm-hmm. you wrote the book. Was that in your mind at all too, as like one of the reasons for the book? To be like um, to sort of like be this like thing that kind of like yeah, sparks somebody. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, when I read Four Hour Work Week, that was like the catalyst for me to start working and everything I was doing yeah. eight years ago. And I was like, I want to create a piece of work that opens people up to possibilities, yeah. to what's possible in their life. And to like start moving forward towards that life that they want. And uh, absolutely. So that's great. I mean, I, <clears throat> I like also, you have a, a thing about nature in here too. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, you totally. have all these different <laughs> challenges, you know, a 30 day challenge here about how to, you know, fill up your buckets, which I think is extremely important because playing games, having challenges, having a project, whatever you want to call it, is something I think we should always be doing. And uh, I think you give some great examples of how to take it on so we don't have to think of our own challenge yeah and that was the whole idea i was like you know i could I, i'm a writer fundamentally yeah. so i love i just the craft of writing i love i love mm. actually like obsessing over sentences and, right, structure right. and stuff like that <laughs> so i'm a weirdo like that um but fundamentally also i, I want to write something that was you know i'm in the middle of my life and mm-hmm. i'm i have my days are full yeah. you know and and i have a lot of friends who are in the same position and i want to, to create something that was actionable for somebody that already had a full life and where they could just like they get, there was something to do every day where they could just flip it open. I mean, literally, you can you can read this not linearly. You can mm-hmm. pick a chapter. Anywhere, it's yeah. a day. Say like, this is something I'm gonna do today. You know, it's short, it's sweet, but it makes a difference. And a lot of the stuff is also all scientifically validated. You right. know, there's there's research behind it. Um, but the you brought up the tree thing, which is which is something that I've known intuitively for, for life is that like my reset is nature. Yeah. It's either the woods or the beach. Um, for me, I grew up, the beach was the end of my road. So the water for me is really mm. like where I touch stone. But also, I mean, there's something about being in nature, especially walking in the woods, which is just like profoundly calming. It's a major reset for me. So I got really curious and it turns out there's that, there's, there's a ton of research on how nature literally, you know, it changes our physiology mm. um, and our mindset and our, you know, the chemicals that are coursing through us. Um, there, there's actually, there's a Japanese word, shinrin-yoku, which translates to forest bathing. And there are shinrin-yoku designated forests in Japan, where they wow. literally designated where, you know, you can go into them. And just walking in these forests, leave, it will literally change your life. Um, but, you know, not all of us have forests, right? Mm-hmm. So the research also shows that simply being in an office or being at home during the day and being in a setting where you have a plant in view that you can see versus having no greenery at all, even that tiny thing makes a really big difference. Interesting. Yeah. So have plants or it's crazy. <laughs> something in your office or in right. your house. So it's like as simple as, you know, like you can go out for a walk where you know, you're, you're around a whole bunch of greenery. But even if you can, in your, in yeah. your home or work setting put something green in it and it actually makes a difference like I, little things i believe that i mean just imagine yourself in a box all day you know with no life in there nah. it's hard to feel alive i guess when you're in the box constantly without life but when you put life in there then yeah you know you're connected in a different way yeah i mean there's even there, there are studies done on um hospital patients um ones where you're in a room where there's you can't see out the window w- with trees and others where there's actually a window with trees the recovery rates are faster. No they experience way. less pain, and they're discharged more quickly from the oh, hospital. That's crazy. When you have a window where you can see like nature outside, that's it. crazy. It's amazing. I think it's all. I mean, that's. It seems. I mean, it seems true because it's like if you can see possibility of growth, and if you can see like yeah, yeah. something that's alive, you probably feel more inspired to get out. I don't know, but yeah. as opposed to just seeing a brick wall. In, yeah, in New York City, you know, across the street from your window or something. Right, whatever it is, it just it makes a difference. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I know. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. What's missing in your life right now? Um, space. Um, two things: space, uh, but that's a deliberate choice right now, mm-hmm. and working with my hands. Um, so for me, you know, I've 
whenever you're bringing something to life, which is a big project you worked on for years, things get compressed yes. and your days get, get busy. Um, and I hate that word busy, but, but it, you know, the saving grace for me, and I think it's really important for anybody is that it's okay to fill your day with a lot of stuff, but do it deliberately. Don't just take it by default. Don't let like other people's stuff pile into your day to fill it up. Fill your day with stuff that you've chosen matters to you. So right now, like uh, there's not a ton of space in my days because mm-hmm. um, I'm bringing something that I care deeply about to the world. So they're filled as I like bring it out there, but I'm choosing, you know, this is, so I'm choosing what I'm going to do. I'm choosing what matters, why it matters. And I'm choosing to be in this place for a certain window of time where I know I'll then step back out of it. Yeah. And at the same time, I still have a daily practice, you know, which keeps me, my mindset still and allows me to still optimize and fill my vitality mm-hmm. bucket. And if, that starts to get messed up, I'll pull back. Um, the other thing is working with my hands. I, uh, there's something like that. I don't know if you feel this way too, but I grew mm-hmm. up as a kid working with my hands and I was an artist also. And then I built houses in the summers during college. Mm-hmm. And there's something about creating where you're like you're physically using your hands to make something. And then at the end of it, you can step back and just like see it and touch it and yeah. feel it and be like, I made that. That's cool. And I haven't been, I've been creating a lot, but in the digital space over the last couple of years. It's not the same. And I'm feeling this itch mm. to actually dive in and just work with my hands more. Mm. What would you make? A guitar. Mm. <laughs> For some reason, I've been I talking about this that. for years. Um, mm. and, 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 and so part of it is like, that's going to be actually kind of like probably one of my rewards. After um, the book comes out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Wow. It's uh, gonna, to learn to actually you, do that. You haven't done it before. No. I haven't, you know, you can, you can go to these you know, programs basically. And Classes, you know, schools. Yeah. Dive intensively. I've had a friend yeah. do that too. Yeah. 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 Um, you go for like a week or two and you like make a guitar, right? Yeah, exactly. But even just little things like working with my hands, like I've started, like I'll start painting a little bit again mm-hmm. and just to feel like I'm making stuff with my hands, um, mm, and making cool. art. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I feel like I don't have that itch, but I have the itch to create art through sports. Yeah, yeah. to play, to use my, to use my yeah. hand to like throw a ball, to catch, to like touch people, like be messy on in sports and playing basketball. It's like I, that's my itch. You know? Yeah, but um, and maybe because I'm just not that talented at the artist stuff yet. Maybe it's not someday. even that. It's it's that that is your artistry. Right, right. You know, is, your yeah. canvas is is athletics, is yeah. sports, is movement. For me, it's beautiful. It's, yeah, it's you know, I feel like. No, I've seen you. I've seen like footage of you in like, right. various <laughs> different settings. I'm like, that is mastery. Right, that, yeah. is, that is artistry. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what are you grateful for in your life? Uh, my family. Like, I mean, I'm grateful for so much. My God, there's like almost nothing that I could say I'm not grateful mm-hmm. for. But the thing that comes to me first and foremost, my family. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, my wife is just one of the most amazing people on the planet, and my kid is, you know, an awesome human being who's yeah, growing cool. into a really just a, a you know. A She's good, awesome. A good person. Yeah. Um, who cares about the world? And uh, um, yeah, and and my wife is also my business partner too. So mm-hmm. we literally work together and live together and breathe together twenty four seven. Um, and we're married almost twenty years now. Wow. How do you um, navigate that when you're married and working? Yeah, together? it's so funny. People are like, "You guys should do some sort of program or workshop <laughs> on like building a life and building a business together." And we're like, honestly, we don't we we don't know how it works <laughs> yeah. you know it just does we have different skill we i think a big part of it is we're really fortunate in over a period of a you know long time together we've grown as individuals in a way where we're still deeply complementary to each other mm-hmm. you know and sometimes honoring your own personal path has people growing away from um the way that they they need to be to stay together mm. and and that's a tough thing but it's also an okay thing wait say that again honoring your own personal path what you know i think so it's really important to to honor your own personal growth to grow into the person that you know like to become fully expressed as who you are as an individual in the world you know and when we're in relationship with other people whether it's a partner or friends mm-hmm. or even business partners you know, if each one of us are like doing what we need to do to become who we need to be individually, we change, we evolve. And over a period of years or decades, sometimes you change and evolve in a way where you're still deeply connected and complementary and the relationship still is profoundly beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you evolve in a way individually where you're not as complementary anymore. You know, it doesn't mesh nearly as well anymore. Maybe it's a business partner. It's time to you know grow apart. Maybe it's a partner in life, um, and so part of you know a part of it I think is work. A part of it is all the classic stuff for relationships. Part of it is also you know honoring who we need to become individually, mm-hmm. 
and there's a certain amount of of just luck in that still being the person mm. who's still deeply complimentary and you're like we're we're blessed yeah. in that we've both grown individually in a lot of ways in a way where we're both like just so profoundly still in love with each other um and love working together that's amazing you know and co-creating stuff together and building community and um and we also just on a practical level like from a business standpoint we do different things yeah yeah and we have different mo's and yeah. we're good at different things so, so it works it works in yeah. both areas in the relationship it's not for everybody <laughs> yeah that's crazy yeah yeah i mean we're growing so much i feel like so many people are growing apart and in relationships as yeah. well, right? Marriages, it's like more and more divorce. Yeah. Do you think it's because people are growing into who they truly are more and more, or do you think it's more of a cop out or they're just not working enough? Yeah. I um, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Cause I everyone's think, different, huh? Yeah. Although it, here's a really interesting, um, bit of data and I, I haven't validated this, but I've sort of actually been told it recently, uh, is that, arranged marriages actually have a higher success rate than what I would call mm -hmm. sort of like a natural you know, yeah. like love-based marriage. And I don't, there's, there may be all sorts of societal constructs that make that not right. healthy or healthier. I don't really know, but it's just kind of like that. When I heard that, it stopped me. I was like, huh, what's really going on there? But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't have an answer to that, but, um, I just, it's crazy. This life, knock on wood every know? day, I consider myself blessed that's and grateful. Amazing. Yeah, that's great. Congrats on that. Um, this is called the three truths, three truths question. Cool. So it's your last day, many years from now, mm. all your work has been erased from time yeah. and you have a piece of paper and a pen to write down three things you know to be true about everything you've created in your life that you would then pass on to your family, friends and the world. Mm. What would be your three truths? Uh, lead with love, uh, meaning matters and embrace the unknown. I like those. Mm. They're solid. <laughs> uh, two final questions. Uh, but before I do, I want to make sure everyone, before I ask them, I want to make sure everyone gets the book, How to Live a Good Life by Jonathan Fields, Soulful Stories, Surprising Science, and Practical Wisdom. Make sure to pick it up right now. And um, in on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, there'll also be a link on the show notes on how to get this. So go pick up a copy um, and let Jonathan know what you think. Um, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Jonathan, for your incredible friendship to me and your incredible grace. I look at you as such an incredible, as a graceful human being. Oh, thank you. And that grace for me is like is like guidance. You're like this guiding individual human being that really leads with soul. And for me, it's something that I really appreciate because you know you helped me with so many things and when I was going through a lot of discovery in myself, I turned to you for guidance and grace. So I want to acknowledge you for what you've created in the world and how you've shown up for me to be willing to, you know, bear my soul to you and, and talk about things that, that happened to me and really reveal it on the podcast a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, that, that episode that we did together brought so much healing for not only me, mm -hmm. but so many people in the world. So mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge you for your continual, showing up, giving, leading with love, and um, being so graceful. Uh, thank you, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. Of course, yeah. And the final question is, what's your definition of greatness? Mm. Um, yeah, it's like it's probably evolving for me. Um, owning the, f doing the work to really understand who you are what matters to you in the world um, and how you need to express yourself and then um, aligning the actions, aligning the way that you live every day with the truth of who you are in a way where you close the gap between that person and the person you bring to the world. Mm. Jonathan Fields. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate it, brother. When you show you're passionate about something, people are attracted to energy that is passionate, that is grateful, that is fun, that is loving, that is expressive, that is creative, that is expansive. They're not attracted to people who are closed off and guarded.